2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. I'm sorry, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a what? Now, now stay with me. He is a what? New creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become what? New. Look at it. And all things are of God who hath, what's the next word? Reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given us the ministry of reconciliation. Now this is very, very important, my friend. I want you to notice that it is not the seasoned veteran who is supposed to be reconciling. Because if you look in verse 17, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a what? New creature. The day that you trusted Christ as your Savior, you were to become, which is found in verse 20, look at it, now then, we are what? Ambassadors. Some people think that you must mature your way in to giving the gospel. You do not mature your way in. If you're saved, you're in. Let me go back and say that again. A lot of people think you have to mature your way in. A lot of people think, well, you know, I got more to learn before I share the gospel. I, I have more to learn before I start opening my mouth and telling people about Jesus Christ. And, and it's very interesting. I don't know how long that is for some people. It may be 20 years. It may be 30, 40 years. But I can tell you this. The Bible says when you become in Christ, you become a new creature. That new creature, according to the scripture, is supposed to be in the ministry of reconciliation. Look at verse 19, to wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Now there you have the deity of Jesus Christ and the fact that Jesus Christ is equal with God the Father. It does not go God the Father... God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and each loses part of the Godhead as it works itself down. You say, well, well, Pastor, that's so elementary. Why are you even covering that? Ushers, you can go ahead and have a seat. Why are you covering that? Because I think we have Baptist boys marrying girls and dating girls who are of religions that teach that Jesus Christ is the brother of a devil, of the devil, of Satan. Better listen to me, Baptist kids. Don't date nor marry anybody who believes that Jesus Christ is the half-brother of Satan. And the only reason we do that is because we don't realize what does the Scripture say. So understand what it's saying here. To wit that God was where? In Christ. <laughs> I love that right there. Did you get, catch that? That God was in Christ reconciling the world unto what himself not imputing their trespasses unto them which keeps with john three seventeen. he didn't come into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved look what it says there and hath committed unto us the word of what reconciliation now then look at it we are ambassadors for christ as though god did beseech you by us, we pray you, look at it, in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For if he had made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. I'm going to preach to you tonight on this subject, your purpose for being saved. Your purpose for being saved. Being saved is not a condition as much as it is a purpose. You see, when Jesus came to this earth, Jesus came with God in him, reconciling the world unto himself. You know what the verse says in that prepositional phrase? That we are in Christ's stead. You have any idea what that means? That means when Christ went back to heaven, guess who he left here to continue the reconciliation process here on this earth? He left us. And I think sometimes that we are pushing the responsibility back off onto people that are supposed to be our spiritual leaders. 
If you preacher boys are here and you believe God has called you to preach, could I get you to stand? If you're in the auditorium and you believe God has called you to preach the gospel, would you stand? Well, I want you to look at these men right here. They will be the future preachers and pastors across this great land. But you listen to me, dear church member. They do not do your job for you. It is not something that they do because they are going to be a preacher or they are a preacher. Guess what? It is something they do because Christ is in them and they now stand in Christ's stead in this world giving the gospel. We may have a seat. Now, now it's very interesting. If we can just jump right into it, it's very interesting here that most people don't understand what is my purpose of being saved. Your purpose of being saved is not to dress right. The purpose of being saved is not to cut your hair. The purpose of being saved, ladies, is not to dress like a lady. The purpose of being saved is to be in Christ's stead, reconciling the world unto him. It is our job. Go to Acts chapter 20 in verse number 24, if you will. Acts chapter 20 in verse number 24. In Acts chapter 20 and verse 24, it's a truth I gave you seven and a half years ago that I think I want to revisit in this seven and a half years later. Here in Acts chapter 20 and verse 24, it says this, but none of these things move me, neither count I my life, what, dear unto myself, so that I might finish my, what, course with what? Joy. Let me stop right there. I believe that however God has set up your life, you are to finish your course with joy. Your course is different from my course. Your starting point in life was different than my starting point in life. My starting point started September the 24th, 1967, to Bob and Leanne Gray. From that point, I was born in Michigan. From that point, when we got to be about second grade, my father answered the call to the ministry, and we moved to Gary, Indiana, for my dad to attend Hiles Anderson College. My sister Kim and I attended the public school from kindergarten, first in second grade, my sister Kim in one year had chicken pox, uh, mumps, measles, and scarlet, help me Karen, scarlet fever, scarlet fever, those four within a nine month period, she was one sick little lady. And that is why her and I graduated the same year. Uh, people often ask, did she fail? Uh, no, she was sick. She missed so much school that they put her back in my grade. She was put back in my grade to watch me and make sure that I stayed out of trouble. Guess what? She failed. <laughs> but, but my starting block started in Michigan, worked its way down to Indiana, worked its way south to Illinois. By the way, you can tell if you're from Illinois or not because it's not Illinois. It's Illinois. And, uh, and then you, we worked our way down to Texas right here in 1980, and I have been a preacher's kid, a PK, all my, all, practically all my life. That's my course. That's where I started. This is where I'm at. Everything along my course, I am to finish my course with joy. Listen to me. If you're saved, you have no reason to frown. You have no reason to complain. You have no reason to be grouchy. You have no reason to be upset. You have, you have life living on the inside of you. You've got God living on the inside of you. And the worst thing that happens to you is death would be the best thing, my friend, to ever happen to you. That's why Paul said, I don't count my life dear unto me. Because my course that I'm running, I am to do it with joy. Let me stop and just tell you this. It's about time God's people put a smile on their face and walked around life grinning like a Chesser cat because you've got God living on the inside. About the time you think that those burdens start to get you down, do your course with joy. You know, we use this verse a lot at graduation. We'll tell the students at graduation, oh, finish your course. Don't quit. Hang in there. Sometimes when somebody comes to the end of their life and they pass away, we'll stand and go, they have finished their course. But can I tell you, if you go on, look at it, verse 24, that I might finish my course with joy and the what? Ministry. Say it out loud. And the what? Ministry. Listen, I'm about to tell you. Everyone, everyone is in full-time Christian service. I'm going to say that again. Everyone, 
is in full-time Christian service. Boy, we, we, we've gotten into this thing of, well, you know, are you called or are you not called? I believe that anybody who does this job better have the call of God on his life. You don't do this job without knowing this is what God has called you to do. But we have made it to where we truly think in our world that, well, you know, there, there's a special duty. Sacerdotal is what the IRS calls it. If you are doing your sacerdotal duties, and they include five things, then you're considered part of the clergy class. And if you do those five things, and uh, I think one is to marry, one is to bury, one is to baptize, one is to do the Lord's Supper. And I think that fifth one is to fleece the sheep. And uh, so if you do your sacerdotal duties, then you are considered a clergy, and then the IRS looks at you like you're special. Can I tell you, honestly, everybody is special because you've got God living on the inside of you, and the Bible says that when you were given the course you were to run, you're to run it with joy. That means through divorce, smile. That means through tough times, smile. That means through abandonment, you're supposed to smile. But listen to me, you were also given a ministry. If I were to ask you what your ministry is, some people say, oh, well, I'm an usher. That's your duty, but that's not your ministry. You, you say, well, what's your ministry? Oh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm a singer. Well, well, that may be your duty, but that's not your ministry. What, 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 what's your ministry? Oh, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm part of the nursery elite now, the 24, the 26 that go into the jaws of death and once a time a week and come out with diapers everywhere. And uh, I'm part of that elite. No, that's your duty, but that's not your ministry. You say, well, well, pastor, I'm part of the PA guy. That's your duty, but that's not your ministry. You say, well, I play the instruments. Well, that's your duty, but that's not your ministry. Look what your ministry is. In the ministry, verse 24, which I received of the Lord Jesus to what? Testify. Testify of what? Of how beautiful the building is? To testify of what? How padded the pews are? I like what one preacher said. He said, if I'm going to spend money, it's going to be on the pews and get, have reinforced pews. Nice, plush pews. Let me tell you something. If we ever decide to get rid of the pews, I'm bringing recliners. Amen? Be the best attended church ever. And then give you a volume button. And uh, so, but look at it. To testify, look, what, what? The gospel of the what? Grace of God. Listen to me. The day you trusted Jesus as your Savior, he gave you a ministry. And that ministry was to testify of what happened to you. I love listening to sermons. And I've been stuck on the old Baptist forefathers. And I was listening to J. Frank Norris. And before J. Frank Norris got ready to preach, he pastored a great church there in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And he had a, 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 a Bible college there. And this guy was in his junior year, obviously, the sermon I'm listening to. And he called him up to the platform. And there was this exchange taking place between this great man of God and, uh, and obviously this junior in, in college. And he said, how, many, how much longer do you have to go? He said, sir, I, I have one year left to go. He said, don't you come back to school. Did that church call you north of Dallas? And the, man, and the young man said, yeah, he called me north of Dallas. He said, then good night. Don't show up to class Monday. Get out there and go from house to house. Crawl underneath that barbed wire fence. Go up and knock on that door. Get every name of everybody living in that house. Tell them what Jesus did for you. And don't come back here. I don't want to see you until you have knocked on every door. And the young man said, okay, okay. Do you know what he was saying? Get about what you're supposed to be doing. You listen to what I'm about to tell you. Your life won't be complete, my friend, until you take your ministry very seriously. Your ministry is not what you do in the church house. Your ministry is what you do outside of the church house. I'm going to say that again. Your ministry is not what you do inside the church house. Your ministry is what you do outside the church house. And guess what we are to do outside of the church house? We are to testify. 
It's time for us to stop being picking and choosing what we get loud over and what we get vocal over. And let's start understanding our ministry is to testify of the Lord Jesus Christ and the grace of what has happened to us. How many were there the day you got saved? And I let that one sink in. It's like we're choosing up teams for softball. And I looked at the guys that pick a number between four and six. And the one guy said three. And the other guy said five. You know, were you, were you there the day? You, you'll catch that later. Were you there the day you got saved? And then guess what? You were handed, you were handed a ministry. Brother Rubio and I had to take a trip just north of Paris uh, this week, and when we were coming back through, we stopped and got a bite to eat. And while we were sitting there eating, our, our waitress, it was kind of dead around us, and, uh, and, and our waitress and Brother Rubio said, hey, ma'am, do you know Christ as your Savior? And I sat there, and as he was witnessing to the lady, you say, how long does it take Tony Rubio to witness to somebody? It takes exactly one basket of chips. Because I know. You say, how do you know? Because I took one bat. I was so engrossed in what was going on. I just kept chipping and dipping and eating and chipping and dipping and eating and chipping and dipping and eating. I got all the way to the down. You know how you put so much salt on there that, that now you're, you're licking up the salt on the bottom? You know what I was thinking to myself? Tony, would you hurry up? Man, I need some more chips. I'm hungry. And right there, she bowed her head and trusted Jesus Christ as her personal Savior. And on the way out, she looked at her friend and said, hey, hey, we prayed. We prayed. Let me tell you something. You won't be a happy Christian until you realize your ministry is not inside these walls. Your ministry is outside these walls. And you listen to me. God has given you a course so that you will meet people on your course that I will never meet so that you can testify of the goodness and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let me give you several things. My aim tonight, my goal tonight is very, very, very simple. You know what it is? For you this week to talk to somebody about Jesus Christ and tell them what Jesus did for you the day you got saved. Now, let me pause and say this. It's going to be hard to do if you've never met him on that day. I don't say that slammingly, and I don't say that belligerently. I'm just trying to tell you, unless you have never met the grace of Jesus Christ. Can I ask you a question? Where would you be had you not trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? And when you and I understand that the day you got saved, you were handed your ambassadorship papers, and you were given the ministry of reconciliation, and you now stand in the very stead that Jesus stood in, reconciling the world unto himself. And it is your job, it is my job, to make sure we can fulfill the ministry that was given to us. You know, it's very amazing. The more you water down the word, the more you water down your testimony, the more you water down what God, the more, let me tell you something. Don't let the liberal crowd tell you that they're more vocal about Jesus Christ because you don't get vocal about Jesus Christ until you are in tune with what he did for you on that day. You got saved because at that point, that's your job. That's my job. No, 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 pastor, your ministry is preaching the word. No, my ministry is when I take a track that I don't have. <laughs> and uh, my ministry is when I take a track and I hand it to somebody and I say, can I tell you about the day I got saved? Can I tell you about the day I got saved? I'm going to ask a question. When, outside of a soul winning time, do you tell somebody about your Savior? I was thinking about I had at least six other sermons I could have preached tonight. But I've been so convicted about this the past three months that I, that I truly think we look at our brother Landers and we look at him saying Jesus saves and, and he's testifying of the grace of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we look at that and we think, well, he's doing my work for me. No, he's not. No, he's not. Brother Landers, how many people you think have trusted Christ? I, this year? How much? 222 people. 222 people. I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to tell you a story. I was out of town. No, I'm not going to tell you a story. Brother Landers, 
I won't do that to you. 222 people. All because a man is willing to take a sign, stand up and say, Jesus saves. Jesus saves. No, no, his ministry is down there at the church. His ministry is his, is his ambassador class. Not according to that scripture right there. According to that scripture, his ministry is to testify of the gospel, the grace of Jesus Christ. We have several things. Number one, your life was meant to touch people. Your life was meant to touch people. Do you know that's why God puts you on the course? I think we bemoan too much where we're not, where we think we need to be. Do you know what midlife crisis is? Not attaining where you thought you would be at this age. Where you're at at this age, my friend, it doesn't matter if you're in your 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and you're like, well, I always dreamed. And as you're looking to the sky dreaming, God has said, would you let me just direct your life so you can touch people? We are, can I just be honest with you? We have become ashamed of Christ. The average American Christian is ashamed of what the Lord has done for them. You wouldn't treat your wife the way you're treating Jesus Christ. I wouldn't treat my wife the way I treat Jesus Christ sometimes. And I think there needs to be a resurrection and a revival to where we understand the day, my friend, that you got saved. If you even dared name a day that you trusted Jesus Christ, then you were handed the ministry of reconciliation. Listen to me. Go as deep theologically as you want to in the Word and try to figure out what the toes on the beach are all about. And theologically, what does this mean? But what good is it if we are not doing the ministry God has given us to do? Churches fight all the time. Are you post-trib, pre-trib, mid-trib, you listen to me, you let that trumpet sound, and you're out of here. That's the only thing you need to know. But those who don't get out of here are those who have never, they've never had a chance to trust Jesus. God has taken our life, and he has directed our life, not for the sake of us getting glory, but for the sake of somebody hearing your testimony about how Christ saved you. You listen to me, you businessmen. And I say that with all due respect. God didn't place you in business for you to shake hands and close deal. He placed you in business because he knew that that man would not listen to anybody else but somebody on his level, on his playing level. And all it simply takes, if you can talk about golf and you can talk about racquetball and you can talk about sports and you can talk about this and you can kind of say, hey, how's your wife and how's that? Then in God's dear name, would you take your ministry very seriously and would you just simply say, hey, can I ask you a question before I leave? Because if it's not outside the bounds of work to talk about golf, then it can't be outside the bounds of work to talk about Jesus. Did you hear about the Russian pastor who right now is facing it in Russia? He attends Brother Angel's church, the church I got saved at. That's the church he's out of in Faith Baptist Church in Bourbon, Illinois. He had to send his wife back. All because he had the guts to stand up and tell people about Jesus Christ. We expect that in Russia, but I don't, think, I don't think anybody's going to come to your house, walk in your door without knocking, and pull everybody out and interview everybody because you said something about Jesus Christ. It is your ministry. It, it's your ministry. And I promise you that God didn't bring you to the level that you're at if he didn't want you to meet people around you to where you said, hey, hey, before you go, could, could, could you got a couple minutes after work? Hey, sir, would it, would it be okay if we kind of talked? And I, I think that we have come down to this, and I point my finger at me as I point it at you. I think basically we have become cowards because we want the world to think of us as, as okay. We don't want to be... I, Independent, fundamental, Baptist. So because of that, we're going to water down our testimony? Let me tell you something. There are a hundred things I will not talk about that I believe. Because I believe with all my heart. Because it's inconsequential to the greatest conversation you'll ever have with somebody. And that is this, sir, ma'am, do you know Jesus Christ as your Savior? Do you know that you're going to heaven? How many times do we walk past the people that God has put on our path? Second thing I want to tell you is this. No one, no one can live your life but you.
He said, what does that mean? That means the people I come in contact with, the assistant pastors, can't talk to about Christ. That means the people I come in contact with, that nobody else can do it. There are those people at the level that I live And I don't mean I'm better than anybody else, but can I tell you something? There are just those certain things that pastor has to take care of. And when pastor has to go take care of it, there there are just certain things I have to go take care of, but I know this, whoever I meet along my journey of I have to take care of it are people that I'm supposed to testify to of the glory of God and how I got saved. There are people on my street, don't live on your street, so my street, I'm responsible. There are people that I work with that really need to be saved, so y'all pray for me. And, uh, but no one can live your life. Next, next. Your course is what gives your testimony credibility. Your course is what gives your testimony credibility. For me, I was talking to a man this morning, and we were kind of uh, uh, joking a little bit. And something happened this morning that was quite humorous to me. And, uh, and he was shocked. He was like, Pastor, are you telling me you have never? And he brought up a subject. And I was like, no, I never have. And he was just like floored that I had never done a certain thing. And I was like, I never have. And he said, wow, I can't tell you how many times and much more that I have done. And I said, you know what? That's what's going to give you credibility when you start telling people what Jesus Christ did for you. I don't know if Brother Lyons is here, but pass this along to Brother Lyons. Brother Lyons texted me about a man we've been working with, and so my phone is sitting on my dash uh, uh, in, in a text message. And, uh, and this afternoon I was out making a couple of visits in, and in between church and the hospital and getting back. And, and so I kind of ran and was making a visit and he jumped in the car and we were talking about what had happened to him getting saved. Brother Lyons texts me and all of a sudden a text message came up about a man he's trying to help. And Brother Lyons in his text message had kind of mentioned a couple of things. And I said, see, see, read that right there. And he read it. I said, see, I've never experienced that. You know what he said? Oh, been there a hundred times. And I said, do you think you could help him? He goes, absolutely. I don't think you and I understand. Everything that has happened to you is giving you credibility when you look at somebody and say, can I tell you about Jesus Christ? And they look at you and say, well, you have no idea what I'm going through. Yes, you do. That's why God is so good as to work everybody's life to where you saw Christ and you trusted Christ at the time you did. Why? Because there are people out there going to die and go to hell. What good is it if we sing well and we preach well and everything looks good and people die and go to hell? Where is the boldness for our ministry? You say, Pastor, you're making me feel really bad right now. I want to encourage you that God... The next thing, God would never give you a ministry if he didn't mean for you to succeed. I want you to think about this. God would never give you a ministry if he did not mean for you to succeed. God will not ask you to do something that will not be successful. Your success is already predetermined because he was successful on the cross. You know, I'm not trying to be bombastic tonight, and I'm not preaching against a lot of things that would wow you, because isn't it sad that when we get down to the most important subject ever, and that is the ministry of testifying about Jesus Christ to people around us, it becomes the most boring subject, but it should not be the most boring subject. It should probably be one of those kinds of subjects that you and I relish, and we just look for opportunities, and it's like, give me some tracks. Let me carry them like Pastor doesn't, and let me carry them, and let me, God, would you please, I promise you, God, the next person I see, the next person I come across, God, I'm going to tell them, tomorrow morning you're going to wake up. Isn't that deep? Tomorrow morning you're going to wake up, and tomorrow you're going to start your day. I'm going to ask you to do three things, three simple things. Number one, pray God put somebody in your path. Pray God put somebody in your path. Pray that God Put somebody in your path. Do you know, if I'm not careful, my, my, my 
routine will go house, coffee, church. Church, coffee, house. House, coffee, church. Church, coffee, house. House, coffee, 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 house, coffee. Church, coffee. And I would just want to say publicly thank you very much for uh, all the Starbucks uh, gift cards. Are you ready? I have received $198 worth of Starbucks cards on my birthday. I am like loving life right now. How many would like to go get some coffee? And, and, uh, and, and I've been buying for everybody around me. And Jordan and I were on a trip, and, and, uh, and, and I turned around to this girl behind us, and I said, hey, it's your lucky day. Come on. I'm buying. And we got to witness to her. We're standing right there in the middle of a mall. And, and, and you, you listen to me. If I'm not careful, my routine becomes so, in the sad, in the sad, becomes so religious, I meet no lost people. It becomes just as my, I, I've asked Willie a hundred times, do you want to get saved? He won't, let, he won't let it happen. I walked to John Smith's office and wanted to say, hey, Brother Smith, I'm Bob Gray. I'm from, it doesn't work. It doesn't happen. So I have to pray, God, let me meet somebody. This morning, I was taking and getting some coffee for, uh, for some people I picked up, and, and I'm standing in McDonald's buying this coffee, and this lady comes up, and she says, Pastor Gray? And I was like, yes, do I know you? And she goes, no, you don't know me, but I know some people that go to your church. And they are the most wonderful people I've ever met in my life. And I was like, really? I said, well, I'm glad that you enjoyed them. And, and she said this, they have tried to talk to me a couple of times about the Lord, and I've just kind of shut them down, but they still are, are kind to me. And I said, well, ma'am, do you have a couple of minutes I can tell you about the Lord? She said, I don't right now, but I just want to come back and tell you. Listen to me, Pray that God gives you that opportunity this week. I mean, pray. Say, God, I want to do my ministry. Your ministry is not making cookies. Your ministry is not sending packages. Your ministry is not the nursery. Your ministry is not playing an instrument. Your ministry is not cleaning the church. Your ministry is to testify of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Pray. When the phone rings and it's a wrong number, it's not the wrong number. It's an opportunity. When somebody knocks on the door to sell you something, it, it's not the wrong time. Buy something and then do your ministry work. Second thing I would tell you is this. Want the Holy Spirit to direct you. Want the Holy Spirit to direct you. Pray, God, give me an opportunity. And then go, Holy Spirit, I'm not smart enough to know. But you are. Direct me. Listen to me, you're not completing the circle in who you are, and that's why there's a void. See that? See that? You're saved. The day you were saved, my friend, you were given your ambassadorship papers, and you were given your marching orders, and your marching orders was to tell people about Jesus Christ. And the reason people are searching for new things, and they're out there searching for this world out here that will fill a void, listen to me, the only way that void's going to be filled is when you understand you were not placed here to make you feel better. You were placed here, my friend, in your course of life where you're going so that God would use you. You say, Pastor, I don't even know what to say. Get a track and be honest. I don't know what to tell you, but would you, if you'll read that, it'll tell you about Jesus Christ. Pray. Ask the Holy Spirit to direct you. And the third thing is this. Make it a way of life. Make it a way of life. There ought to be, my friend, such a soul-winning, witnessing fervor about our church. But I'm going to be honest with you. We're not the witnesses we need to be. We're just not. We're just not. Two weeks ago, I think it was, one of our men, and he'll know exactly what I'm talking about, he was cutting through the fellowship hall, and he said, hey, baby, we got any more Spanish tracks? And I said, well, we're ordering them. They're on order, and I'll try to find you. You could tell the look in his face was one of, man, man, I got to have some Spanish tracks because there are people that I work with that are Spanish that, that we got to get them the gospel. I'm going to ask you this week to take a personal interest in your ministry, not my ministry, your ministry. 
You know, it's funny. It's funny. People want to further their ministry. Have you noticed that? People are all about their ministry. It's funny that they never, never identify their ministry as testifying. It's always kingdom building. Your ministry is to testify. Our dear friend, I've been trying to think of your name since I got up here. Miss Amy, what? what? Sharon, Sharon, I'm sorry. I had Wanda up here. I had a hundred other names up here. And there's Sharon. Sharon's sitting down right here. She came this morning. And, uh, and, and she was sitting right down here telling me that until Amy opened her and told her, she, she, she did just like this. She said, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, I, I was just like secure. Like, like it, all, it all made sense. <laughs> and I was like, what a great way to put it. It just like all made sense. You want to know why? Because somebody realized her ministry is testifying. Housewives, you're an ambassador. Husbands, you're an ambassador. I'm going to end with this. I had six other sermons I could have preached on tonight. I won't preach them all right now. But I was thinking, you know, what is it really all about? Is it, is it truly all about husbands getting along with wives? Is it truly all about, no, it's all about this one thing. If you live and you die, and you run your course, and you do what you're supposed to do, even with a smile, but you don't fulfill your ministry, then you've wasted your life. I have wasted my life. Here's a true test. When's the last time you testified to somebody about the grace of God? Heavenly Father.